Let's pray together. Father, we thank you very much for your blessing our life. Even when we do not acknowledge you or consider your work day by day in our life, you're there blessing us. You are faithful. And we thank you. We ask that you will give us the understanding and the wisdom we need as we bow before your word and consider your way in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. That's the youth message. John 14, 6. Okay. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. I was a senior in high school. I was going to a, a Youth for Christ rally over in Kansas City. And uh, talking to some friends, we're all trying to figure out well, I'm the way, the truth, and what? What does that say? Nobody can figure it out. Life. Life, that's right. You know this already. Yeah. I didn't know hardly any scriptures when I was a senior in high school. That's pathetic. Oh well. That's true of a lot of people. The Word of God in our minds makes all the difference in the world. Now, been talking about eggs, a chicken egg. Tell me something about a chicken egg. It has a... It has a yolk. That, that's the chicken that's going to grow. Okay, he'll turn into a chicken. Yeah. Oh, it has a shell. A shell. And how many holes does that shell have? Zero. Uh, yeah. Ten thousand. Ten thousand holes in every chicken egg. There's ten thousand. They're so small you can't see them, and the yolk can't get out, and the the protein, that white stuff in there, it can't get out, but air can get in, and that's the air that. The little chick lives on for quite a while. What else about an egg? There's that clear stuff in there. When you cook it, it turns white. But there's clear stuff. That's protein. That's what the chick develops on. That's what feeds the chick. And it has these little white strings. You'll see, anytime you break an egg, you'll see white strings going two different directions. That holds the yolk in place. So you can slam up against the side and damage yourself and die. So so God is a, is a perfect engineer. He knows how to make everything right. If he made a car, it would last forever. If he made a plane, it would fly without any maintenance. He's the perfect engineer. Now there's all kinds of checks. There's all kinds of things that happen. I've mentioned before, the little, the little quail eggs. And before, and when the, the quail are developed enough to make a noise, they'll be making noise. They'll be peeping inside that shell. And you can hear them peep before they come out of the shell. And there's lots of enemies. Like when a, when a quail is born, it's so small, it's as small as a, a large grasshopper. And if there's any turkeys around, they gobble them up. Think of their grasshoppers. Eat them all up. And of course, fox, coyote, they love to have some eggs for breakfast. And so the mother quail, when there's danger around, she makes some clucking noises, just certain clucking noises. And all the little chicks inside the egg be quiet. How did they learn that? Did they go to school no. and learn in their safety class? No. <laughs> no. They were 
born with those what we call instincts. Instincts are things that you're able to do and you never learn. You're just born without ability. You know when you take a baboon and its baby is born, it immediately grabs a hold of its mother, its fur and the skin of its mother. And it just hangs on there for, a, for many, many weeks. If it didn't, it wouldn't live. How did it know to grab onto its mother? Instincts. Instinct? Didn't go to baboon class before it was born? Oh, okay. I don't think so either. All right. How about a, a baby kangaroo called a joey? They're just real little when they come out of the womb. And they climb up the mother and go into her pouch. And they nurse her until they get fully grown. <coughs> Wait a minute. Who told that little Joey to climb up there? The mother. The instincts. Instinct. The mother didn't teach the baby to do anything. Mother doesn't even help the baby. The baby falls off. Too bad. The mother what does not help the baby. Nice mom, huh? Yeah, what yeah. a good mother. You got a better mother than that. Yes, we do. <laughs> now, those are instincts. Things that we know without even being taught. How many instincts do we have? Zero. That's very good. We have zero. We have no instincts. We have to learn everything. We're totally helpless when we're born, and we have to be taught everything. That's why we make schools. Normally, parents used to teach their kids everything they needed to know or at least everything their parents knew. But they said, well, some things we don't know, we need to make a school to teach them more. Because we don't live on instincts. God programmed animals with instincts, <coughs> and they live on their instincts. We live on our knowledge, what we learn. That's why learning is so important. It will open up more and more of life to you. All right? What well, part of God's word do we automatically know and never have to learn? John 316. <laughs> That's a good passage. John 316. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. But we didn't learn that automatically. We had to be taught that. What Bible verse did we learn by instinct? God loves us. We learned that by instinct. But no. some people grow up and don't think God loves them at all. Oh, that the word God exists. You're close. Very close. The concept of God is a concept that everybody is given by God. But as far as Bible passages, we know zero until we learn them. If we hide God's word in our heart, He'll show us what to do. He'll guide our life. Let's go to this passage. John 14, 6. This is what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. Let's pray. Father, we're completely dependent on our parents when we're born. And you made it that way. That we would have a father and mother that would have someone who could teach us what it means to understand the world around us. Father, you have given us an opportunity to know you through your word. Help us to realize that we don't automatically know you. We have to learn about you. And in learning about you, we can appreciate and love you. Thank you very much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. And without Bible teaching in the soul, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that God exists as a rewarder and becomes a rewarder for those who seek Him. Let's seek the Lord in Psalm 34. Psalm 34.
I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. We'll stop there. Let's have a silent prayer, confessing any known sin that we have, and asking that God might open our minds to understand His Word. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word and we thank You that You have put us in a position to learn Your Word and to grow in grace, to grow in knowledge of who You are and what You do and how You do it. We thank You, Father, that Your Word is simple, straightforward, and clear. It is not hidden. It is not double talk. But it is straightforward that we might understand and we might trust you. Help us to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> From David, when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he left. Let's start with 1 Samuel, and let's see this incident in David's life. First Samuel chapter 21 David is running from Saul the first king of Israel Saul is wanting to murder him and he's David panics and he takes off he goes to Nob where the high priest and the Levites are who offer the sacrifices for the nation. And uh, he lies. He says, I'm on a secret mission from Saul. And I had to leave so fast I didn't take any food or weapons with me. He's not a very good liar. Ahimelech, like. he tries to help him. He gives him food. From actually the, the showbread. They put new fresh 12 loaves out every morning. And he, he takes some loaves right there. And he gives them to David and those who are with him. And he says, uh, you know, it, it was such a secret mission. I, I, I left without a weapon. You believe that? You believe he's, he's out on a secret message to fight the Philistines or whoever? And he forgets to take his ammo. Hello. And Ahimelech, he says, the only thing we have here is Goliath's sword. And that was a huge sword. Very heavy. Very difficult for uh, David to be able to wield. He said, well, that's a great sword. It was given to Goliath because he became the champion of their city. These are city-states. 
farmers all around the city, the territory, they would always come into the city for protection. That's a great sword, I'll take that one. So he goes, he takes this sword, as he says in the end of verse uh, nine, there's none like it. Indeed, there was none like it. It was given as a memorial to their great hero, their number one hero in their army, Goliath. Didn't do Goliath any good, did it? No. Now, in verse 10, we see the story. That day David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath, hometown of Goliath. But the servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David, the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. David took these words to heart. He realized, man, did I blow it. I walk right into a hornet's nest. To my bitter enemies, I'm in their city, and they have control over me. And was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So, he pretended to be insane. Now these Philistines are Greek peoples who have settled in the land of Palestine. That's where we get the word Palestine. from the Philistines. And the Greeks had a very strong teaching about those who had kind of lost their senses through whatever it might be. Uh, chemical imbalance, bad stuff happened to them in life, whatever it be. And people who just, they just had, didn't have all their ducks lined up, their eggs in one basket, however you want to say it, they were just a little bit off. They didn't have any medication for that in the ancient world. And they said, if the gods have touched this person and made him a little loopy, we better keep our hands off because we don't want the gods to make us loopy. So they would make sure they didn't harm people who had mental illness, or as he would say, insane. David was pretending to be insane. Well, now how do you pretend to be insane? Well, while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate, graffiti all over everything, just making, that, that makes sense, no words, just nonsense stuff, scribbling over the walls. And he let his saliva just dribble out of his mouth and cover and drip off his beard. And everybody said, he's nuts. Aki said to his servants, I love this, Aki said to his servants, look at the man he is insane. Why bring him to me? Am I so short a madman that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? I have so many of my officers who can't win a battle. The idiots. Do I need another? I got plenty of madmen. What he's saying here is my officers, I send them on a job. I send them off to, to fight certain people. When I, they fail every time. I don't need any more crazy people in my command. Get this guy out of here. And of course, in their thinking, they don't want the gods to harm them for harming a person who's gone out of their mind. Must this man come into my house? And they kicked him out. David wrote the psalm we're at, Psalm 34, And the first thing he does when he gets out of the imprisonment, out of the hands of the king of Gath, 
is praise the Lord. Oh, thank you, God, for delivering me from that impossible situation that I got myself into. Ever get in that point of place in life when you do something so stupid? You say something so stupid to your wife or husband or to some person in authority or you do something that's just idiotic. And you think, what was I thinking? And it might get you in trouble at work. It might get you in trouble in society. And there we are. Hopeless and helpless with no resource and no way to get out and no way to talk our way out of it. And if we talk, it'll just make it worse. People say, yeah, you are an idiot. And so God delivers him. David pretends to be insane and God used it. Was God a part of that? No. But he still delivered David. You know, sometimes... We don't earn it and we don't deserve. But God delivers us anyway. Sometimes He takes us out of horrible situations of our making and we didn't do a thing to make it right, but He delivered us. That's the grace of God. He wants to bless His children. Now He talks about one of the great... problem-solving devices in the Christian life, confessing our sin. When he, we confess our sins, He acknowledge our sin and He forgives our sin and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We're then filled with the Holy Spirit. Those are the first two great problem-solving devices that we need in life. Divine guidance and forgiveness. Here's another great problem-solving device. If you get to be grace-oriented, not works Oriented, the whole world is works oriented, but grace oriented. God is going to bless me and I don't deserve it. God is going to deliver me and I don't deserve it. God is going to make my way straight and I don't deserve it. Now, there are a lot of things we can say about David, but one thing we can say he didn't deserve all the blessings that God gave him. He did not. The only thing he had going for him, he had a lot of the Word of God in his soul. And God honored that. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Afflicted. What is it that's afflicting you? What is it that just overwhelms you at times? Wakes you up at night? Makes you think twice about whether you're doing, doing the right thing, going the right direction. Afflicted, our soul is being crushed as with a hammer. I will glory in the Lord, let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Because God can take that affliction off of you and you didn't earn it and you didn't deserve it. That's the grace of God. And that's one thing once we become believers, we have to be oriented to His Word, but we also have to be oriented or adjusted to the grace of God that God wants to bless us without us being a part of it. He just wants to bless us because He is a blesser and He becomes a blesser for those who seek Him. And the more the Word of God we get into our soul, the more He blesses us. He graces us out. His plan is called grace. And that's what He wants in our life. All we can do is say help. Here's the problem. God's solution, we say help. That brings the two together. God's solution for us, once we ask Him. In this case, we don't have even an indication that David did anything at all to get out of this impossible situation. He probably did say, help, Lord, I don't know what to do. And he didn't. But God still got him out. And even though David did something that was not truthful, he wasn't insane, he pretended to be something he wasn't, God still delivered him. You know, it's not a matter of our goodness. And while he delivered David, David still had multiple wives. Now, if I show up with more than one wife, you know what you have to do. 
fire me. Okay, that's not part of God's will for anybody's life. Certainly not for a pastor. Fire me. David had multiple wives. He got up to six or so. So he was still sinning in spite of the fact that God was blessing his life. You know what? Every one of us are in that boat. We might not have multiple spouses, but we do have multiple sins in our life. We have sins that are besetting us, sins we can't shake. And God is still gracing us out in spite of that because He's a God of grace, not a God of works. I sought the Lord and He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. And that's what it was about, wasn't it? He feared Saul would kill him. And so he gets himself into a position where he's got a king who wants to kill him. And so his fears multiply and increase. He delivered me from all my fears. Plural. Now David already had the promise of God that he was going to be the next king. David was shown the grace of God in many, many ways. All he had to do is say, Lord, this is what you said. I'm going to trust you. He didn't do that. He panicked. He left the land of Israel we should have been in. And he goes to a foreign land. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. The concept of radiant is you finally found that child in the mall that you lost. Oh, well, you want to hug them and you want to kill them. But you're so glad you found them. All right? And that's the radiant concept. God delivered me again. Wow. Now, he could have been covered with shame, but he wasn't because of God's grace. We have to look at our lives in terms of what God is doing for us, not what we're doing for God. Lots of religious people are doing things for God. And God says, rest, give it up, trust me. This is a grace life, not a work life. And we have to learn how we can trust the Lord in all circumstances. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord, that's a term in the Old Testament for Jesus Christ. The second person of the Trinity, God the Son. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And he delivers them. Because we belong to Jesus Christ, there are stupid things we're going to do in the future. Isn't that amazing? When we believed in Jesus Christ as Savior, He knew the stupid things we'd do in the future. He saved us anyway. And there's stupid things we'll do in the future, bad mistakes we'll make, we'll make decisions we shouldn't have made, and He's going to deliver us because we're His children. Fear the Lord, you His holy people. No, I don't, shouldn't skip verse 8, should I? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Just try it, he says. Trusting with this little thing or some other love. Just, just taste and see. And you'll find out that the Lord is good. He delivers every time. But we have to take the step to trust Him. Trust doesn't say we've got any great intellect or any great power or any great insight in our life. But we just take the step and trust Him. Lord, I'm trusting You in this. I messed it up. Could You put the pieces back together and see what they'll do? Blessed is the man who takes refuge in Him. You can take refuge in your psychology. You can take refuge in the advice of your spouse. You can take refuge in your friend's advice. You can take refuge, go to the bank and pull out some money and try to solve the situation. There's all kinds of things that you can take refuge in. But if you take refuge in the Lord, He will deliver you. Fear the Lord, you His holy people. That's a believer. For those who fear Him lack nothing. God's going to take care of you in time. Period. The lions may grow weak and hungry. That's the thing about lions. Sometimes they don't have good luck. 
hunting for prey, and they're just starving to death. And they go out and hunt until they find something to eat. And indeed, the lions may grow hungry and faint, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Lack no good thing. David says later, we'll see that. I was young and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. That's an amazing statement. Come, my children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. That's the beginning of all wisdom. You want to be smart in your field? Give fear, honor, respect to God first, and He will open your mind to all kinds of things. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. An evil tongue is one that leaves God out of life. That's an evil tongue. Oh, I don't need the Lord. I'm not going to trust Him. I'll figure this out myself. That's an evil tongue. And an evil tongue means you'll end up telling lies to get yourself out of situations. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. The word righteous is a word for a believer. In the Old Testament, it said the righteous have meant those who had believed in the Savior who would come. We are the ones who have believed in the Savior who has come. Both are called righteous. Righteous means sinless. I'm not sinless because of what I've done. I'm sinless because of what Christ has done. He lived the perfect sinless life. He was crucified. He took my sin. And when I believe in Him, He gives me His righteousness. And I have a new title, The Righteous. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Why? Because they belong to Him. They're His children. Just like you gather your kids to go home after worship. Do you forget them? Not generally. We need to check our priorities. We forget, oh yeah, I forgot my kids at church. Or would you go, go back and get them? That doesn't happen. Maybe when it's a newborn. I mean, I remember when, when we got our second born. And we loaded up the car and we forgot the baby. <laughs> but we realized that pretty quick. Back to get the baby. God never forgets His children. He watches you all the time. And He still loves you. And always will love you. The love of God is yours forever and ever and ever. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and His ears attentive to their cry. Ever hear a baby crying, church? I have. But I never called down the parent about that because that's what babies do. All right? Why do they cry? Well, maybe they need change. Okay, they're uncomfortable. Maybe uh, dad uh, changed their diaper and the safety pin is not quite closed like it should be and they're in pain. Perhaps they have a pain in their stomach and they need to eat. They cry because there's a reason. And they keep crying until they get satisfied. That's your life. You cry to the Lord until He answers your prayer. He will not turn a deaf ear to his children. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to blot out their name from the earth. I use the illustration all the time about graveyards and tombstones and I say, We'll forget all these people. You'll go by my tombstone, whatever it may be, and you'll be like, Aura Martindale, who in the world is that? Funny name. And you'll forget me. A hundred years from now, who will know us? God will. He never forgets His children, and He always cares for His children. The righteous cry out, and the Lord 
hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. Even the troubles we make. And we deserve to be in trouble. But God delivers us. We're in a good position, people. It's a good position to belong to Jesus Christ. He is going to bless our life. We're the ones that bring the cursing. He's the one who brings the blessing. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. This is a word, this is a wonderful word. Uh, a picture of Hillary Clinton taking her hammer and smashing to pieces uh, her server, her uh, computer stuff, because she doesn't want anybody to know what's on that. Okay? That's the brokenhearted who have done things that just crush our life, crush our relationships. We think maybe even crush our future. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. It doesn't matter how low you get in life. If you're thinking, oh, the world would be better without me. God sees your situation and God wants to deliver you. Just turn to Him and say, help. And don't barter. Don't say, if you do this for me, God, I'll do this for you. Usually, some stupid thing. I'll give some money to the church. God doesn't need your money. And God's not impressed with your money. There's nothing you can give Him to make Him love you. He loves you 100%, 100% of the time, no matter what. And so you go to the one who loves you the most, more than your spouse, more than your parents, more than your friends. And you say, help. And He will help every time. The righteous person, a believer, may have many troubles. And we do. We get ourselves into troubles. Many troubles head our way. But the Lord delivers him from, the, from some of them. From some. But not others. I mean, some of those we do ourselves. Why should he deliver us? What does it say? But the Lord delivers it from them all. All. He protects all his bones. If you have healthy bones, you're in good shape. The concept of broken bones is you're weak. Try it sometime when you break your arm or something and try to lift some weights or do any work. It doesn't work. Because your bones refer to your health. He will keep you in good health until it's time for you to depart. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The evil the wicked do will come right back on their own heads and destroy them. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. We read it in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is now no condemnation, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a wonderful statement. No believer will ever be condemned by God. When you approach the judgment seat of God, He will not condemn you. He will not condemn you in time. He will not condemn you in eternity because Jesus Christ, your righteousness, has delivered you. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are our righteousness and that there is now no condemnation for we who are in Christ Jesus. What can we say, Father? We get ourselves into binds, into trouble, but you are our rescuer, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's share communion together. The bread that we partake of is emblematic, representative of the sinless life of Jesus Christ. He did no sin. That qualified Him to be our Savior. The drink represents the fact that He drank down our sins. So our sins would never be seen again. And we would have eternal life by trusting Him. All believers are invited and encouraged to partake. Turn to page 88, please. We'll sing all four verses standing on the last.
scriptures for communion this morning is out of 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26. The teaching I give you is the same teaching I received from the Lord on the night when the Lord Jesus Christ was handed over to be killed. He took bread and gave thanks for it. Then he broke the bread and said, This is my body, it is for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way after they ate, Jesus took the cup and he said, This cup is the new agreement that is sealed with the blood of my death. When you drink this, do it to remember me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are telling others about the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, we remember when you were on that cross, darkness was upon the earth. It was certainly a dark day when the Savior of man was nailed to a cross. For our sins, he was placed there. We truly are thankful the Son is back. The Son, our Savior, and the real Son that provides us life. We're truly thankful that he made that trip to the cross, that his righteousness is in our sin's place, and we truly have great thankfulness. Be with each one of us as we remember what he did for us. These things we'd ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Back here, both in his prayer list, are there others that should be remembered? Okay, we'll have to do most of our praying off this prayer list at home, out of time. But let's have a, a few brief prayers together. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you are our God and we are your children. We don't deserve this position. We've never earned it. But you gave it to us when we trusted you. Help us not to waste our life. Help us to keep our sins confessed. And help us to understand that we're the products of your grace. Let's be praying for our families briefly. You are the only source of true blessing, Father. We can bless ourselves with certain material possessions, certain kindnesses, but there's no blessing like your blessing to give us the peace that passes understanding. And we thank you. Father, we would ask that you would help us to walk with you this week, that you would give us your desires and give us the strength to follow through with your great plan. We thank you, and we ask that you would continue to make us people of the word, and therefore people of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It's a great story about a man named Ty Cobb. He's one of my favorite baseball characters. He was something else is one of the greatest players that ever played the game and one of the meanest players that ever played the game he would take a file and sharpen his uh, cleats until they were very sharp able to cut very easily in front of the other team to make sure that they knew that when he came in and slid his cleats were up not down and a lot of people stepped out of his way when he tried to steal second because they didn't want to get cut up. And many, a ball player, even on his own team, said, we don't care for him, we don't like him. He's a good ball player, but we don't like him. That was his character. That's who he was. At the end of his life, he gave his life to Jesus Christ as Savior. And his interesting testimony that he had, he said, I gave my life to Jesus Christ in the bottom of the ninth. I wish I had given my life to him in the top of the first. You waste a lot of time outside of Christ, but you can be blessed throughout your life when you just simply give your heart to him and say, I trust you, Lord. Let's sing our decision hymn together. Stand and sing the first verse of 267, please. <laughs>
Let's share in our response a memory verse there in Psalm 118, 8. Psalm 118, 8. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. Psalm 118, 8. And this week, I will be faithful to my spouse. I will speak the truth in love. I will be courageous and kind. I will be thankful. Let's pray. And Father, give us a thankful heart, because look what you've given us. Our life, our future, our eternity, wonderful blessings in time. You are good to us. Help us this week to taste and see how good you are to those who trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.